Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us today, this afternoon. Uh, to, my name is Todd Hoff. I, part, I work with the RPA, and today I'm excited to host a panel discussion about the innovation in pallets. If you're not aware, today there are over 2 billion pallets in the U.S. alone that are always moving through the supply chain. And today we're going to talk to some industry leaders in the space about what are some of the innovations happening today in the world of pallets regardless of the size or the material, but what are some of those new innovations that are happening? Uh, let me have the panelists introduce themselves. I'll start here on my left. Hello, uh, my name is Brandon DiMedio and I'm with CHEP. So CHEP is a equipment pooling and leasing organization. So we have over 360 million shared and reused assets that are in circulation globally. Um, I lead global product development for CHEP. So responsible for all new product, product improvements, innovation, research and development. Um, I've been with CHEP for 17 years. And previous to this role, I was on the, the product marketing and product management side, leading the, the innovation team for CHEP North America. Hi, my name is Amy Lathrop. I'm with Perfect Pallets. Uh, we are primarily a returnable plastic pallet provider in the United States and Canada. We offer a returnable packaging service where people rent our pallets, use it, ship it, we work on the logistics to get it back to that original shipping point. Uh, but we also offer a host of other footprints that are plastic that we sell for reuse and returnable systems for our customers. I've been with Perfect Pellets for 19 years. And prior to that, I had a retail career. Great. John Mark? Yeah. I'm John Mark Van Maren. I'm the chief product officer for Kapka. I'm with Kapka for nearly uh, six years, or actually six years. Um, I have a long history in this industry. I think uh, Todd and myself, we uh, both worked for a company called GE, where we uh, initially uh, started to develop pallets and containers uh, back in the, in the 1989s. Um, and that's uh, where I went through my, through my whole uh, career. I, I worked for GE, I worked for uh, Schuller Arca Systems. Uh, I run a, uh, the second largest pallet pool in Europe, uh, La Palette Rouge, but that, those were some, those were uh, wood and also some plastic. So I have experience from, from both sides. I also was involved with the GE Capital uh, leasing of, of uh, containers. We had about 1.3 million TUs uh, global. Great, great. Well, to get us kicked off today, I, I'm curious each of your experiences, what are recent pallet innovations that your companies have been doing? Whether that be design, uh, material, or even pooling services, what are some of the innovations your companies have recently launched to the market? Maybe John Mark, we'll start with you. So if you didn't uh, watch the previous presentation, <clears throat> uh, our, we are continuously bringing new innovations in pallets to the market and, and we try to make those pallets lighter and lighter. That's, that's really the goal, which means that wall thicknesses have to be, become thinner, uh, otherwise you won't make them lighter. And we also make pallets, uh, let's say, nestable and rackable. So that's that's an innovation that we're bringing into the in the market. And then there's a lot of let's say um, innovations in in containers integrating with the pellets. But that's that's for later. Great. Well, I think for our point of view, we have also focused in the nestable space because it for the space savings not only for our customers but for our logistical full circle packaging, the offering, we can provide a better cost basis for getting more in a truckload to return them. Um, so that has been innovative to that side of the equation. I think another perspective that we have looked at most recently is putting additives in our pallets like a microband technology that provides um, antimicrobial properties. So when we're supplying partners that are working in a food space or pharmaceutical space or something where cleanliness is very important, it gives them a cleaner tool in that environment uh, when they're in that sensitive area. Great. And I think just to kind of build on what they said, you know, we kind of look at it really three areas. Um, the first being is materials. So most people think of, you know, a wooden pallet, they think of just wood, paint and nails. And that's probably right. But there's a lot that goes into it. There's different species of woods. There's different, you know, forests that they come from. Uh, there's hardwoods, softwoods, different fastening strategies. There's different thicknesses, different moisture content. So we're really looking at that um, in kind of the wooded inside of the business. 
on the plastic side, you know, we have a publicly stated goal of 30% recycled plastics in our products by 2025. So we're always looking to improve that and build upon that with, with any plastic uh, product that we offer. Um, and then the last part is really what I'll kind of call the service technology or our, our repair centers, because we do have to repair pallets. We do have to inspect pallets. So how can we be more efficient there? How can we be safer there? How can we re in, you know, reduce that cost for us as an organization? Um, and at the same time, how can we improve our, our customer perception, our customer quality, to really make sure that all of this is driving a quality platform for our customers? Great. So, so to maybe build on the materials. I would like to build on that. I think that's... Uh, Pallets are, are, have to be used, uh, made for reuse, it means that they have to be designed also for repair and recycling. And, uh, and that, that's happening a lot, and uh, that's, that's happening with all the large pooling companies. And I think, you know, John, we've worked well together in, in Europe and other parts of the world, focusing on kind of the circular process that starts with materials, looking at design, repairability, end of life, and building it back. Um, you know, we've worked on a few projects with you and, and over in Shep Europe. Um, that kind of that's been the core tenant of what we've done. So, so I'd like to build on that a little bit around materials. So, John Mark, in your previous discussion, you talked about recycled materials. So, in your perspective, what are some of the benefits of using recycled materials, plastics, et cetera? But are also, what are some of the challenges when working with recycled materials? Well, Maybe start. Let's start with the benefits. So, okay. the, the benefit is clearly a, a better CO2 footprint for, for the user. That, that's clear, and, and, and eliminating a waste problem. Um, but it's not so easy to, to do that because recycled materials are, again, are, are totally different from virgin material. And you have to understand what positions you have to continuously try to optimize the streams and understand the data. So it's important that, that you understand the history of the recycled material. So pooling companies like CHEP, they know their materials. So that's, that's better or easier to work with. But when you talk about other material streams, that's very difficult to understand those streams and where, and where they come from. The challenges are, uh, again, to try to, to, to have, let's say, enough uh, volumes of a consistent quality to generate, let's say, uh, optimized production. And, that, and that's continuously uh, uh, a challenge. Good. So, so Brandon, how would you build on that from uh from a product? Yeah, I think it's, you know, if, if I think about it, it's kind of three to four key things is one is the performance of the material, right? I think, he, I think everyone gets the benefits of using recycled material. I think everyone understands that. Uh, but I think if you think about some of the challenges is one is the performance of the material and how are they going to perform in, in the supply chain? The two, I mean, to talk about the elephant room is the cost, right? Because the, the cost of recycled materials, depending on where you're at, can be more or, or, or less than virgin material, which is, comes into all of our economic equations. Um, the third is the supply. You know, different parts of the world have different maturities of infrastructure. And that really, you know, adds to some of, the, some of the challenges. And then the fourth thing I would add as a challenge is really around the regulatory. When you start talking about platforms or containers that are used in, in food safe environments or fire safe environments, you have to be able to, as Jean-Marc said, be able to track and, and control that material and improve wh where it's come from. So that is, that is a really big challenge that, that we're coming up against in certain areas with recycled material. Great. Amy, how, what would you add? I think there's a great story that can be told on the recycled side because we can do an offering where we can take scrap material at a customer, grind that down, use it as part of our recycled material, and it comes full circle. It's going back into that pallet. They're taking that pallet into their process. We use the pallet to the end of its life, and then you can go ahead and grind it right back down and put that formula right back into the next new pallet. So it's continuing that life cycle of that recycle um, system, that sustainability, and you can really extend that sustainable story, not only from your single product, but you're now taking product from potential customers, using it, and then returning it back to that system again. So that's the longer term story, yeah. is what we like to focus on. That's great. That's great. So my next topic is automation. I think we've all walked Pack Expo in the past day or so and seen so much automation happening across the whole supply chain and across really the whole ecosystem. I'm curious, how do you incorporate design for automation? So as you're designing a new product or you're improving a product or, or improving a product, how are you incorporating automation into your designs 
or your material selections? Wendy. Um, I, I mean, for us, for a plastic pallet, I, I think we are ripe for automation because we can provide a very uniform product that is to spec. You know, you don't have the tolerance sometimes that people see with wood. Um, we have customers coming to us and say, I use scrap wood and I get all these weight, different tear weights and it kind of can be a hodgepodge. And I can say, well, I have a very uniform two spec pallet that can go through your automated system, whether it's a feeder, it's a... Um, you know, a line that you're working down and it's going to perform exactly the same way. It's not going to damage your product. It can go right smoothly through that automated system. Right. Um, so plastic really lends itself to that in that scenario. Okay. Good. I, mean, I, would, I would like to, yes, really plastic is for automation is, is the ideal workhorse material. Because you cannot, you cannot get automation with wooden pellets or you can, but that, that's uh, at a more difficult level. And plastic is ideally suited for that. So you can, Optimize your product for all the all the systems that are in place. You can also uh, implement tracking devices very easily into your plastic pallet that will help uh, all the sensors that that are used, RFID tags, etc. So that's that's ongoing, and I think this work is happening together with the system integrators that are building, you know, uh, warehouses where everything is about space and speed, and 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 then. The benefits of plastic pellets is really that there is no stoppage of of of, of uh, automated systems, and that's that's driving this this change rapidly. A big challenge, however, is still in the U.S. is certain requirements about f fire retardancy. And so there are uh, there are certain things that you have to, to take into account that has have an effect on on on, on those uh, on those systems. Yes. What would you add, Brandon? Probably a little different approach than uh, these two. Uh, but I think, you know, look, I think when you think about automation, it is one of the core enablers of a lot of our pallet improvements because it's driven by the customer. It's driven for, you know, the future change. It's where the supply chain is headed. To your point, you walk around, everything is automation, everything is AI. There, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of it. Yep. Um, but I think what we need to do a better job as, and it's something that Chep and Brambles are focused on, is, is working with the automation companies and working with the integrators because not every pallet is going to be perfect in a shared and reused environment. So if you want to get the benefits of reused pallets, of pallets that flow from the top of the supply chain all the way back down, things are going to happen to them throughout that journey inherently. And so I think there's an opportunity to, to really you know work with them on what might a shared and reused pallet look like. What are the specifications? What are the tolerances? As opposed to you know making these systems for a, a perfect pallet. That, that, that it is perfect the first time, but as it gets used, even plastic pallets tend to have a little bit of wear and tear on them. Um, so I think that's really the opportunity is how do we collaborate across you know, customers, um, integrators, automation supplier, pallet providers, pallet poolers better to, to help solve this issue. It's really for our customers at the end of the day. Great. Let me shift uh, topics here real quick around sustainability. So there's a lot of discussion around uh, 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 reusable pallets. How have your companies I impacted the sustainability of your customers or your customer supply chains? What are some of the examples that you can share around how you're impacting a retailer's metrics or a customer's metrics around sustainability by using a reusable pallet? Uh, working, yeah. I think um, five, six years ago, we started talking about this uh, with, with our major customers. Now, in every customer interaction, in one of the first discussions that we have, we're talking to sustainability directors, to, to people that first question, how sustainable is your pallet? And we have, to, we have to discuss life cycle analysis for that specific reason. So it's, it's becoming the crucial qualifier uh, with, with major companies. It's not a... It, the, the, the procurement director is not the, the key uh, driver. It's the sustainability director that makes the first uh, decision. Is, is your pallet good for our operations? Yes or no? Then you can, can continue. Great. Great. How would you answer that, Brandon? Yeah, I think, you know, our model naturally is inherently sustainable with the shared or use model, the circular model. Um, but it is something that we're striving to improve upon and striving to be better at. You know, we have the zero waste to landfill publicly stated goal that we're working towards. We have the 
you know, 30% recycled plastic and 100% is the ambition even after that. So it is something that we're constantly striving uh, to improve upon. Yeah. I think for us, um, we work on telling a story with some of our customers that say previously used wood, one use, throw it away. It creates all of this um, garbage in the marketplace. And we've been able to help them understand the value of a reusable tool in their system. We can show them how they can either buy or rent a plastic option that travels better. It's easier to handle. Um, it doesn't cause load failures in transit. The product doesn't get damaged on the way. Um, you know, and by providing a returnable service for them or they can get something, a very high quality product, they can rent it rather than investing and having to buy it. We can bring it back to the point of shipping again and again for them. They can see the system working right in front of them by reducing all of that waste in their environment. And um, sometimes it's hard to see how that works until somebody can come in and really show you step by step the benefit that they really weren't thinking about. A lot of times people stumble at the, the price point. And that's the barrier to entry, but it's really not about the price point. It's the total life cycle of that asset in your system and all the benefits it can bring along the way. My next topic is really around innovation adoption through the supply chain. Uh, I'm sure each of you, and we've all come to PAC Expo before, we see new ideas and new innovations in pallets. I'm curious, what are some of the challenges of getting a new innovative solution adopted by the supply chain? So you can have a great idea, but how have your companies kind of driven the adoption of a new solution or new innovation in the marketplace today? Brandon, do you want to start us? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, when you think about innovation, there's, there's, there's two things. There's the idea, there's the solution. And then there's the actual, you have to make it happen. You have to put it in, in, into market. That's the true innovation. Having an idea isn't really an innovation. It's just an idea. So, you know, that is something that, you know, we have focused on. We, we're now looking at product innovation from end to end, from idea development and the commercialization piece or the implementation piece and making sure we have proper accountability and ownership for that. Um, the second thing I would say, too, is if you start with customer-driven innovation, or you have market-driven innovation, and you're listening to your customers, and your customers are the one asking for something, or you're developing a, a need or a product that fits a specific need for a customer, it makes things a heck of a lot easier. You, know, you don't have to do the we will build it and they will come you know, model. You have a product that you've been working on with them throughout the whole process, so it naturally it makes it a little bit easier to launch. Yeah, um, yeah for us, uh, innovation is in our blood, but I think uh, we are at our best when we are really collaborating with customers. Means that it's not that we are uh, designing things, thinking things up, and then presenting. This is how you have to do it. It's really working in the same room or in the same uh, area and and uh, trying to figure out the best solution together with the customer, together with the with with the user. And that that's that's I think was the lesson that we've learned. Uh, uh, this this collaboration is essential to to get faster adoption because if we we have good ideas but I mean timing can be right but if you got your customer jointly uh, developing the product it's it's a it's a big it's a big win. <clears throat> I think sometimes it's just getting into the trenches with your customers to help them on the educational side to see that the things they do every single day that they don't think about how to see it in potentially a different way that has a better benefit. Um, people really get stuck in, in what they've always done. They don't know a different way and they're not really open to thinking about it in a different way. But I think when you look at the challenges that they deal with day in and day out, whether it's with a process or with their team, I mean, take, take a nestable palette, for example. It's an easy conversation to have with somebody that's never worked with Nestables before to say, hey, you can stack them in a very neat, tidy stack. They interlock in place. You can pick that up with a forklift and move it around your facility and not risk it tumbling. There's no wrapping. There's no strapping. Same thing when you load it on a, on a trailer to move it somewhere as empties. You know, you take a lot of that safety, risk, 
labor time spent in wrapping and strapping out of the equation. And they don't really think about that unless you have that specific educational conversation. So a lot of times it's just education, communication, to look at what they're doing every single day in a slightly different way to change that paradigm right. to create an opportunity. And I think to kind of build upon what John Mark said as well is it's with your customers and it's also the, finding the right partners to help you drive and accelerate innovation as well, right? We've got a global product development team of 40 people. You know, 10 of them are, are sitting right here. But if you look at all these people out here in their booths who have different technologies, different innovations, there's thousands. So it's how do we tap into the external partners to help us drive and accelerate our innovation as well. So having the right partner or finding the right partner is also, I think, really key in, in commercializing the innovation. Yeah, I want to add on to that. With some partners, even we go into joint IP. So actually, that partner is sitting right there. So we're developing products together where we have joint IP. So that goes very far in, in, in the way that we collaborate. Yeah, so, so i just like to build on that a little bit. In my background, you know, I've done innovation at a company like Chip. I've done innovation with retailers, but there's so many other partners throughout that supply chain. The transportation company, the logistics provider, the cleaner, the cleaning processes of a reasonable asset. It's really innovation happens across the whole ecosystem, not just with the retailer or not just with the pallet producer. So, great. So, so one, one last topic that's big is around food safety. So there's a lot of work happening that will be in the next one or two years around FISMA or food safety, uh, food safety of reusable assets. I'm curious, uh, how are you working with your, your customers to prepare for that, either in your product designs or your business models or, or your pooling services that you're doing? How are you starting to prepare with your customers around the topic of food safety in the future? Yeah, we, in Europe, we are, uh, say, working on certain procedures or certifications. Uh, there's a procedure called EFSA. So you, 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 you can become, let's say, certified for food contact applications. And that's what we're preparing also for because this, this food safety is a requirement in the market. And this is very complex to, uh, to achieve for, let's say, uncontrolled recycled streams. So um, we're focusing on, on EFSA procedures in Europe. Um, and, and we're kind of uh, trying to translate that also to the U.S. And I can just add for, for the new products we're doing is that food safety and you know, hygiene and washing and cleanliness is it's, it's part of the process. It's, it's part of the, the inbound process. It's part of the design requirements. Um, and the second part of that is, you know, we have, ec we have experts. Just talked about partnerships and you can't do everything and you can't be everything. You know, so we have a, a person on our team who leads regulatory affairs and he's got external experts that help us to make sure that our washing standards are, are okay, that the food safety is in considered in the design. And we use them to help us. Mm -hmm. right. How would you add? I think on the design and the um, preparation, I mean, sometimes it's just listening to that customer and understanding their needs. We have some people that it's very important in that wash process to be able to have as many drain holes as they want so they can wash it and it drains efficiently. There's other people that want to use our, our pallets for containment. They don't want the spillage to leak onto the floor. And so it's about being nimble and flexible so that we can provide an accommodation or fill a need for somebody um, using a similar footprint, but using it in an entirely different way. So it's just having those open ears to understand how can my product be used slightly differently by somebody else because they have a different need. Right. And then my last topic, I promise, is, is I'm curious how you each kind of approach design for service or design for end of life. So how are you designing your products so they can be cleaned e easily or how can you design them so they can be repaired or how can you design them so at the end of life they're easily uh, recyclable back into another reusable asset? So John Mark, maybe start with you. Yeah, so we do that more and more. So uh, an example of that is, let's say, separate parts that can, you can clip on and clip off to repair and recycle. So we have, we have pellets that are consisting out of a base and, and re separate runners that you can replace uh, just by mechanical uh, detachment. We also have f f separate feeds that you can replace. So that's re replacement and repair is, is becoming standard for plastic. And actually, it's very easy to do with plastic because you, you can attach those, those things. 
uh, and, and then end of life for plastic is actually very far away because technically speaking, you can make many, many uh, uh, recycle uh, cycles with different plastics. So end of life for plastics is probably 150 to 200 years uh, uh, down the drain. So I think the, <laughs> the benefit of, of plastics is, uh, is uh, guaranteed. It? Yeah. Yeah. Good. How would you add it? Um, I would say that we're very cognizant of what we're using material-wise to go into our pallets because we've always come at it as an end goal is that we want it to be fully 100% recyclable at the end of life so that it can go back to be reused into a new one. So you have to really um, be careful what you're putting in on the front end to do that. And so there's some materials we choose not to use because it would compromise those standards. Um, we're careful when we're thinking about additives. Um, you know, e we've even been looking at even bio material to integrate, to uh, again, be looking at that environmentally friendly material, but what does that do to the properties at the end? So we're looking at it full cycle to make sure every little piece that we're putting in is something that we can do something with it at end of life. Great. And how about you? Yeah, just agree with, with both of them. I think, you know, if you think about it in the front end of the process, it makes your job a lot easier in the back end of the process. If you don't think about it, the front end of the process, it makes your job extremely, extremely difficult. So, you know, we try to include that as part of, you know, our design and iterative process and working with partners and making sure that's on their mind as well. And then this, the second part of that is now what we're starting to think about is now as we're getting more familiar with what our waste is, what can we use that waste for? So are there other innovative products that we could create with some of our own internal waste, whether it be wood or plastic, that we could then turn into a, a, a positive story or, or, or a positive product and drive value for us and our customers as opposed to being waste or recycled? Great. So a question for the audience today. We have a roving microphone that's out there somewhere. But, uh, but I'm curious, any questions from the audience? Uh, Rick LeBlanc has questions. I saw him. Rick. Hey, Rick's raising his hand with the, with the fancy shirt. He is now. <laughs> right over here. Nice, nice job, everybody. Really good. Um, as it relates to recovery material, we talked a little bit about embedding intelligence inside your assets and your pallets. How does that change your approach to recovery and recycling, the fact that you now have electronics or RFID tags, the cap got, you know, like six or seven maybe or eight on a pallet. Um, so how, do, how does that change the cost of recovery of material? Yeah, I think if you, you know, well, one of the challenges we talked about with recycled material was having that transparency and having that visibility of where that material came from. So using it on your own assets and being able to show that story or have that information or have those records, I think is going to be a really key step in one, improving our own product performance, but two, as you start thinking about some of the risk and regulatory things that come up with food safety, fire, et cetera, I think that information will really prove invaluable uh, as, as um, we learn about it. That's crucial. T tracking and tracing of, of the materials where, where it origin is, is, is essential. To build on Rob's question, you know, an example would be you have RFID tags on your reusable pallet. At the end of life, what happens to the RFID tag in your process of recycling or reusing? So <clears throat> the main materials that we use uh, is polyolefin, polypropylene, polyethylene. The tags that we use are sometimes made of polypropylene and there's an adhesive. In, in our process, they're just basically uh, regrind and are reused in, into, the, into the production. Uh, but there are other techniques uh, of, of labeling which do not require an adhesive and there it's basically it's a it's a polymer and that's uh, let's say less uh, degradative for the material properties so things are happening in that way and and also i want to add that you you see more and more that there will be put tracers into materials to understand the origin and where the material comes from who's the producer and what's in it and that's that's uh, with 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 artificial intelligence, we are able to, to analyze this material very rapidly and, and keep control of it. Great. Any other questions in the audience today? It's not very often we have uh, three people in this space all in the same place, so. 
question over here. I do have a question. Um, looking at innovation around end of life, We've talked about some of the challenges. Amy mentioned biomaterials mixed with polyolefin uh, composite uh, as one challenge. You know, some, some plastic pallets have steel inserts or, or fiberglass inserts. Uh, Chep's blue pallets have blue paint that has to be mulched. What, what can what are some of those challenges and how are they, those being, being addressed or, or have they been addressed? Yeah, I, I can talk about that. So we, we do quite some recycling of pellets. Um, and basically, we, another example is the beverage pellet pool in, in the Netherlands, running with Coca-Cola, Heineken, all the breweries, etc. These pellets make many trips. At, at, when they're broken, we, we get them back. We, we take them apart and we sometimes replace uh, the grommets uh, that are, are used underneath or on top. Uh, other pellets that are metal reinforced, uh, basically the, uh, when they're damaged, they are cut open, the metal is taken out, or even, even more uh, uh, strange, metal is grinded with the plastic, and the plastic and the metal is separated uh, based on density. And that's the same for protruded or glass fiber reinforced uh, units. So if you, if you are able to basically uh, separate material on density, uh, that's, a, that's an easy process to incorporate. But it has to have scale. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do that for, for uh, 500 pellets. You needed it for 10,000 of pellets. What would you add, Brandon? Anything? No, I think pretty much what he said. And for the wood, you know, I think we do use a, a food-safe wood paint. And we have outlets, you know, all through the country where we're able to find alternative uses for this wood waste. And, you know, hopefully one day we'll be able to have our own um, use for this wood waste as well, where we can use it for our own products. Would you add anything, Amy? Right, currently, we only put recycled content into ours. So I am not trying to filter out any metal or fiberglass or you know any of these other additives so it's really not something that we are focused on because we're we're pretty protective about what goes in on the front end so one more question here in the back yeah um you mentioned fisma earlier to earlier in the conversation how important is washing the pallets going to be to your customers moving forward washing the pallets for reusable pa uh, pellets that's essential because um, I mean and that's coming back to technology so uh, there it, it's it's crucial that uh, there is no contamination in pellets but it's more crucial that no contamination gets out of pellets so washing is for control and food safety but also for hygiene is is, is an essential service uh, to have in place and to make sure also that the pellets when they are getting to a customer are dry and do not create whatever spills or whatever happens. I think you have to be careful what sector you're looking at. There are certain sectors that they have no regard for washing. It doesn't impact their business. It's not going to add value. It doesn't matter to them. Um, that there's are, There are divisions that it's essential to what they're doing. So washing becomes very, very important. And... Um, it needs to be a big conversation. So I think it just depends on what type of customer. You know, my customers that don't need washing don't want to pay for that in their product, you know. So you have to kind of keep it separated somewhat. Sure. I think I agree. It looks at the customer segment. You know, where do they participate? Are they first mile, middle mile? How are they using the reusable asset? What are their requirements? So it's not really a, a strong answer, but I think it really depends customer by customer on how they're going to reuse use the returnable asset. Great. We have time for just one more question, if there's any other ones out there. If not, I want to, I want to, my gentleman, my friend in the back is going to hold this up. We, uh, we just recently, uh, the RPA just recently released a, a reuse, and the how of retail. So it's how to do reuse in the retail ecosystem. It's a white paper we just wrote. It's about 90 pages long. It was written through all our member companies. And it's available on a QR code back at the stand that Mike's holding up. And again, it's free for you to download. It's also available on reusables.org. And it's really 90 pages of everything about uh, 
how to do reuse within the retail ecosystem. So I get a thumbs up from John Mark. So thanks everyone for joining today. And again, please come back to some of our other sessions.